It's 6 o'clock in London, it's 1 p.m. in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young. The IPO Vid live stream series 13, episode two. That means we're up to a cataclysmic episode 74 starts here. And we begin with a spot of tribal warfare. No, no, I don't mean what's going on between Russia and the Ukrainians. That's a truly wretched dispute. Rather, we're talking about the difference between the Agricultural Committee-backed regulators and the Finance Treasury Committee-backed regulators in the USA. The SEC and the CFTC, finally, the crypto battle has spilled into the open air with news of the SEC deciding that they're going to charge a product manager, or at least former product manager of Coinbase, for insider trading. Not only is there an ongoing turf war, but also even Democrat former chairman of the SEC, Harvey Pitt, is criticizing the current SEC chairman, Gary Gensler. Meanwhile, indeed, the Wall Street Journal ran an interesting headline yesterday, Gary Gensler Stonewalls Congress. The SEC chairman, the Wall Street Journal notes, is acting as if He's above all that. How disappointing. Don't Congress know their place by now, ladies and gentlemen? That's what I would be wondering. Meanwhile, over in crypto land further, still FTX are seeking to become a behemoth at rapid pace. Are they growing too far too fast with their offers to bail out Voyager and acquire Bitthumb amongst a multiplicity of other bids? Look, I applaud FTX. I applaud the fact that they're raising money apparently when they may need it. But then again, given their desire to revamp CCP clearing to their advantage, and I have to say on behalf of Exchange Invest, the newsletter of the exchange world that we edit, we also believe that happens to be to the systematic disadvantage of the entire derivatives world and beyond. I'm sort of a little bit perturbed that F FTX are needing to bolster their balance sheet. As we said on Monday, July the 4th in Exchange Invest 2393, you know, $250 million spent here, $250 million spent there, and sooner or later you're talking about real money. Not talking about real money, but talking about phone tapping. Now, I'm lost here, actually. The NSE, holy hoax crisis, we got through a lot of the stuff. We could see where there obviously seemed to be shenanigans, which could well be dealt with the courts when it came to prioritizing access to certain parties, which is totally unfair for low latency trading. But why is phone taping deemed phone tapping at an exchange. It strikes me the barrel bottom has been found in the NSE case, which is now turning into an NSE purge with Chitraram Krishna, the former CEO, briefly freed, but then on the same morning, sent back to court and given a further 14-day judicial custody in what is called the phone tapping case, but looks a lot more to us like the phone taping case. Finally, in today's run round of all of the different news that you can, of course, read first in Exchange Invest, the daily bulletin of the bourse business worldwide, we've been talking about crypto exchange layoffs and very sanguine reading it makes too. The cumulative total just from a select number of different exchanges in recent weeks has popped through the two and a half thousand jobs lost mark. And don't forget, that's not including the people who did didn't actually get to start their employ with the likes of, amongst others, Coinbase, because their job offers were rescinded. How the mighty have, well, suffered some problems during the course of crypto winter, as we see swinging job losses by percentage across the different platforms. And that becomes very interesting when you see the possibility that some of these exchanges are losing 30% or more of their workforce and they're not minnows either. Fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to be having that sort of a downbeat discussion today. We're discussing something really, really upbeat with a fantastic guest. I am delighted to welcome Peter Wrights to the studio. We're going to be discussing building sustainable commodity markets worldwide. How can an exchange build sustainable markets? 
Peter, gosh, he has had quite the illustrious career centered around particularly the Deutsche Börse Group. He's been CEO of EEX and ECC since August the 1st, 2011. He graduated in mathematics and started his career as a product manager with Deutsche Börse in Frankfurt in 1991 and worked at Dow Jones Indexes in New York from 2000 to 2001 before joining Eurex, where he was a member of the management board until 2018. Nowadays, as the Chief Executive Officer of EEX and ECC for 11 years, Peter has overseen the, and I have to say this here, dynamic development of EEX and ECC as a member of the relative supervisory boards, indeed, since 2007. Peter, it's fabulous to see you today. I'm really interested in the sustainable markets topic, really interested in hearing more about the incredible rise of the EEX where in the world are you today? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm actually in my beautiful home in the city of Leipzig, which is where the headquarter of EX Group is located. What a beautiful city. I must say, I'm a big Leipzig fan. Coming from Belfast, we were incredibly honoured. I believe one of the 250th anniversary concerts of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, they decided to take the Leipzig Linenhaus Orchestra all the way to Linenopolis, Belfast, for one of those conferences, concerts. And a magnificent concert was, it, you know, good grief, that must have been 30 something years ago when I was merely a boy. Fabulous stuff altogether to know you're in Leipzig. Let me just say hello to a few people who've already joined the show. Les Calvert, very low latency. I could see Les was offering us greetings before the show even got underway today. Good evening to you, Les. And good evening to Peter Secon. Hello, Peter. I hope you and Ari are on the couch and having a good old watch at the show this evening. Martin Watkins, it's a joy to see you. Happy birthday for last week. Hope you had a fantastic party. Sorry we weren't able to make it. Hello, Peter. Peter Wright, San Patrick Young, looking forward to another outstanding IPO vid. Well, Martin, we look forward to your input and questions as usual indeed. And Marcus Ward, good evening, everyone. It's a great sunny evening. Delighted to hear that you don't need to have the central heating on because certainly it's a bit difficult to get the gas at the moment, Marcus. So the longer you can hold off from that in the, in the sunny north of England, the better. So, Peter, it's been quite a career. I mean, originally you joined... Deutsche Börse Group uh, 20 odd years ago. It seems, I mean, at that stage, it was all about the early tale of exciting electronic trading. How did you actually get into the exchange business? Uh, as you said, I, I was uh, a mathematician by education and Deutsche Börse at the time was looking for somebody to calculate their indices. They had just uh, created the DAX index and uh, thought this was a great idea to add a few others. So that's why they were looking for somebody who could uh, combine economics and mathematics skills to uh, create indices for other segments like the bond market uh, or other elements of the equity market. And that's, uh, that was my first job, calculating indices. Wow. And then that took you to New York and you spent a period of time at, uh, at Dow Jones. That must have been quite a contrast after Frankfurt. It was, but, uh, you know, I stayed in Frankfurt for over nine years. And uh, over that whole period, at the end of it, I was managing all of the data business of the Deutsche Börse, which still included the indices. And we had... Uh, one uh, joint venture with a couple of other parties uh, called Stocks. You may be very familiar with the Euro Stocks 50. That is something that uh, I created at the time. And one of the partners of Stocks was Dow Jones Indexes. And they then asked me if I would be interested to run their business development uh, out of New York. And that's how I got there. And obviously, that was a very interesting experience. Great city to... Uh, to live in as a young uh, man and uh, together with my wife. So it, it was uh, fantastic, but uh, I was only there for a couple of years and then got the call over uh, back to Frankfurt uh, to join Eurex. And actually, if I remember correctly, I mean, we're not delving into your personal life here. If I recall correctly, you came back to Eurex, Eurex and joined the, uh, the, the forces there, but actually your, your wife left, was stayed behind in the US for a couple of years, if I remember correctly. 
That is correct. Yes, we did the transatlantic marriage for a couple of years, uh, which was uh, not as bad as it sounds because my first project in Eurex was actually to create an exchange in the U.S. So I spent a lot of time over there, uh, even uh, working for uh, Eurex, uh, which is Frankfurt based. Oh yeah, that was that was. I must say that was a very very unfortunate story. I mean, I th I remember working on a little tiny tiny piece of that, not as much as you did, and it was so disappointing because it all looked to have great potential, and then essentially, finally, the CBOT cut fees just at the absolute last moment, and it was it was quite difficult to get that market off the ground. It's such a shame actually because I thought that was a a very exciting project when when Eurex tried to take its US arm. So. Tell me then, how did you get involved with the EEX? Well, as part of my job in Eurex, uh, I became responsible for the shareholding that Eurex had in EEX. Eurex was a minority shareholder, about 25% uh, was owned by uh, Eurex at the time. And uh, as part of my responsibility of business development, I was uh, representing the shareholder, Eurex, on the supervisory board of EX uh, starting in 2007. So you got involved with the, the supervisory board, although if I may say so, I mean, no disrespect to the EEX of 2007, it barely manages to resemble the exchange that you have today. Tell us a little bit about the gestation, the birth and the development of the EEX over that time. Yeah, I think the first step really was uh, to change the shareholdership. Um, we, when I got there, um, one of the major shareholders of EEX was Nordpool, which is also one of its biggest competitors in uh, the power uh, spot business. So uh, that's something uh, we had to change. So I created a couple of deals that actually brought Eurex or Deutsche Börse in the position of a majority shareholder. Now, that happened in 2011. And then uh, that new construct with the majority shareholder did not work with the uh, previous management. So then everybody uh, asked the question, okay, who's going to run it now? Everybody looked at me and said, okay, I'm going to Leipzig. And uh, it was really a, a small exchange compared to what it is now. It was just focused on uh, power. It was uh, it had exactly one location, i.e. Leipzig, uh, one office, and it had about 110 people at the time. Uh, these numbers have changed dramatically. I mean, today we have uh, 19 different locations all around the globe, and uh, EX Group in total has about 950 employees these days. So it has changed uh, quite significantly over the last 10 years in particular. So, so tell me, I mean, it's really interesting because I think to be fair at the time, some people were rather surprised that you moved from you know, the bright lights of Urex, and it was on such a roll at that point in time in a huge market. And suddenly you find yourself in Leipzig, which, as I say, I do think is a beautiful city, but it isn't a dynamic financial center, certainly in the way that Frankfurt is. Was it a bit of a shock to the system to, to move to EEX, or did you already have a clear idea of the potential of the business? Indeed, that was one of the reasons why I moved. I, I thought there's a lot of potential in the commodity space that uh, is untapped and that can be developed. In some sense, the commodity markets were uh, at least a decade behind in their market development and market maturity compared to the financial markets that we're dealing with uh, in Eurex. So I saw the opportunity, I mean, electronic trading did, did just start at that time in the commodity markets. Uh, liquid order books was unheard of in at least the power market, which was the main business and still is the main business of EEX. So I saw that uh, this, the benefit of what uh, happened in uh, the financial markets could also be brought to commodity markets and the power market in particular. 
That's a, it's really, really fascinating, that whole power market bit. And I want to get back to that in just a moment. Let me just stop for a second and say, good evening, David Delahunty. Uh, evening all, evening PLY. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to see you. If any of you have got a question or a comment you'd like to make to Peter, then we will be delighted to take them as always, ladies and gentlemen. And don't forget, if you get a chance, do please press that like button. A little love goes a long way to helping us up through the algorithms. It's always useful. And speak of the devil, Peter Secon has a question for us. A great name, Peter, says Peter Secon. So since Deutsche Börse, where you had a previous role, acquired a majority stake in EEX in 2011, was there, were there any key business development opportunities that have stood out over that time? In 2011, it wasn't really clear uh, how the various markets were developing. I mean, EX at the time was in three major commodity markets. Power, that's what it has started with and always uh, has been the major business. Uh, then emissions trading, uh, which EX got involved in, in at the very beginning in 2005. And then also gas trading, which started at two, in 2007, but was still completely underdeveloped uh, in 2011 when I got here. So those three elements both had huge growth potential. And, and some of the drivers of the, of the growth uh, story that evolved after that were, number one, uh, a clear trend that already started back then from... OTC trading into exchange and cleared markets. The second driver, I mean, EX at the time was very much focused on Germany. Um, we thought that uh, what made us successful in Germany could also be brought into other parts of Europe at the time, because, you know, European Energy Exchange, which EX stands for, had always that claim in the name. Uh, to become at least uh, European, so that's what we thought we could we can use as major drivers of growth, and then ultimately, uh, we thought other commodities in the energy space could also benefit from the same infrastructure that we were using and sharing with uh, Eurex, for example. It's very interesting when you look back. I mean, when we started in this business, I mean, even you know, 20 years ago in this business, really there was just a little bit of discussion about power markets and electricity markets in particular. And yet you look at how incredibly large and important they have become and indeed systemic. But at the same time, it's fascinating because really they're almost the markets that nobody pays attention to and some, until something goes wrong because they're so absolutely wholesale. They are, and, and uh, I can confirm what you said, but you, you can also see that it's true these days. I mean, the focus is on energy market in Europe in particular. Uh, the gas crisis is uh, still developing, uh, and a lot of the outcomes also have direct impact on the power market. So it is something that has... Uh, now reach the attention of a very broad audience and uh, especially also is in the center of the political attention at the moment. Yes, that's quite interesting because you were not on the radar almost for the first 10 or 15 years of EEX's existence, whereas I'm sure nowadays a lot of people pay a lot of very active attention to you. But it, it's quite fascinating. So you know, you talk about this this growth in terms of how you moved out through those product sets. Was that logical and pre-planned or was it simply a case that suddenly opportunities came in front of you and you realized that it was an appropriate time to move from electricity into these other sets? Uh, I think, you know, if I look back over the last 10 years, that was certainly what happened over those 10 years was certainly not the plan uh, in 2011. It was a combination of different things. Some things we had planned for a long-term uh, strategy, but also some opportunities that came along the way. I mean, part of the growth of EX Group to what it is now, a global commodity exchange, 
which is the biggest power exchange in the world, was also achieved by some M&A transactions that we did uh, along the way. And obviously, you can't plan these uh, years in advance. Uh, so that's also part of the growth story here. And that's very interesting because let's actually hit upon that because, I mean, the story of your term in office, as well as being one of vast expansion of EEX, is one of a prodigious number of deals. I mean, I think I've got about a dozen of them sitting just in front of me in my notes today. And I'm not asking you to go into each one of them in, in detail, but obviously in the early days, they look to have been, if I may say so, you know, logical acquisitions in order to build that pan-European energy market. But perhaps they brought something else with them because you brought, uh, what was it, Dutch APX and you bought Power Next, etc. Um, in 2014. And therefore, that really helped to start build you a more cross-border energy market in electricity, right? Um, how did you manage to then build on that cross-border expansion? Because you've done quite a lot of generic growth as well as acquisitions just in the electricity market, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're not. That is absolutely correct. And, and uh, you know, the, the exchange business, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know that and everybody else who's listening knows it as well, is, is one that is all about scale. And when you are successful in a niche market, and your customers are uh, active in other markets as well. If you can pro provide these markets uh, on the same platform, it's easy to uh, create new liquidity pools. And that's what we did. And that was also the story uh, behind uh, some of the acquisitions. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the regional dimension of it. When, uh, when I got into the energy world, basically, Every country in Europe had its own exchange, uh, and it was almost like a national object of prestige to have one. But it's a very inefficient way to organize a market that is uh, also linked across Europe. So we did uh, a little bit of the uh, consolidation game, and you mentioned a, a few uh, targets that uh, are nowadays part of EX Group. But there's a second dimension to it, uh, and uh, that is new asset classes. Our first acquisition, actually, in 2014, was ClearTrade. And ClearTrade Exchange is, is an exchange focused on the freight business based in Singapore. So that brought us on the map also in uh, the Asia-Pacific region and uh, got us into a completely new business, the freight business, which today is a, a big part of, of what we do. So it it's, has those two angles to it that uh, we have pursued in parallel. And then obviously uh, later on, we had another a couple of acquisitions that uh, brought some completely new skill set into EX Group. Yes, yeah, so, so just touching on those, I don't want to go through every single one of your deals. It sounds as if we're looking back at your greatest hits here, but I mean, it, they've all been very interesting deals and they all have fundamentally grown, changed, somehow or other expanded the pie that is the business of EEX. But talk us through, in 2017, you made this very interesting deal in the USA and you bought Nodal Exchange, which I think is an exchange... Most people have never heard of, even a lot of people in the exchange business are barely aware of it. And you came in very early to, to scoop that up, as indeed you had done earlier with ClearTrade. Yes, indeed. Nodal Exchange is an important part of EEX Group these days because it's not only Nodal Exchange, it's also Nodal Clear, uh, a clearinghouse in the US and with a CFTC uh, license. So. Nodal Clear clears all of Nodal Exchange business, but is also open to clear for other exchanges. And we have uh, indeed a partnership where we're now uh, clearing crypto futures, for example. So, uh, but initially, Nodal, just like EX, started with the uh, power business and has now become the biggest power exchange in the US if you look at the open interest, for example. So it's been a major success story on its own. 
and we help them to accelerate in that growth. And it's a very good piece of the overall puzzle of uh, a global exchange group, EX group. It's fascinating, really, really interesting. Let me give you a chance to catch your breath there, Peter, because you've been doing a lot of talking. I mean, some of the interesting things about the whole electricity market to me is, of course, the fact that it is a commodity. It can be traded as a commodity, but it's a very different commodity because it effectively wastes away in front of your eyes. And as I seem to remember when they were creating a Western Australian electricity market, for example, they basically didn't even bother trying to put Perth and Western Australia on the map because it was so far away. Most of the electricity was having to travel more than about 1500 miles at which point it biodegrades and that of course makes life very very interesting because when you're looking at power markets ladies and gentlemen obviously when you're in Europe and you look at your map on Google or wherever you're looking at it today you can see you get a lot of countries for your 1500 miles even if you start slap bang in the middle of one of the largest ones such as Germany but of course, when you go to the United States of America, you don't even necessarily get that many different states for your 1500 miles before your power is going to biodegrade, which is why you see the markets being quite intriguing in the way that they operate. And of course, as we all know, one of the other very, very interesting things about electricity markets is that they gave us the Continental Power Exchange, which gave us Jeff Sprecher, who indeed these days is the biggest leading entrepreneur in the entire Bourse field. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, we're just coming up for halfway through our show today. If you would like to ask a question or say something to Peter, please let us know. We're here live on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube talking about the whole art of building sustainable commodity exchanges and looking at the EEX experience. Speak of the devil, here's Peter on Peter one again, P to P. Peter Sekon, thank you very much, Peter, for your second question. Peter writes, what do you see the primary role of stock exchanges being in sustainable finance in the new world? Can they do more? Well, stock exchanges certainly can, can do more, but so can we as commodity exchanges. I think this is a whole movement that has just started. And uh, I think if we look uh, 10 years ahead, the whole movement of sustainable finance and ESG finance will be the new norm. And uh, that's something where we as EEX in the energy world can make a big difference. And so can stock exchanges with the listing uh, of the uh, various companies in, in that economy and creating the segments and creating orientation for investors. Uh, I think that's a primary role that exchanges in general have to play. In our particular case, I think the uh, sustainability is not just sustainability finance, it's also sustainability real economy. And the markets that, that come to mind are, of course, the carbon markets, where EX has a uh, big role and, and has been involved since 2005. And... Uh, we have several initiatives that, that uh, we think can help the real economy to become more sustainable and, and become carbon neutral at the end, because that's, I think, where we have to go. Uh, if you look at this fight against climate change, I think we are at a crossroad and a, a, a very crucial point in that. And exchanges like EEX Group can make a big difference here by organizing through market-based mechanism, the best allocation that we can think of for our resources so that we can save this planet so that uh, our children and their children still have an environment they can comfortably live in. Yes, it's quite fascinating. And obviously, from your perspective, I mean, I know that actually the, the whole original development of, of a carbon sustainable market came in 2005. So therefore, very, very early in the life cycle and before you were on the supervisory board. But it's fundamentally very logical to have from one side on the product side to have the electricity, the gas, the energy, and then also the carbon market. Is that also true of the user base? Is there a huge amount of cross-fertilization or are the actual users slightly different? 
No, there is huge overlap in, in these three markets, at least. Uh, and that is also because if you looked at the European uh, ETS, the uh, system that uh, creates the carbon price, it, it covers all the energy industry. And it covers also the biggest industrial uh, consumers of energy. So we have a huge overlap in, in those that trade power, gas, uh, with those that, that trade emissions market just because they're covered uh, by the uh, initial scope of, of the scheme of, of for the European market. Now, you said it, we started trading uh, carbon emissions in 2005, but one big step in developing this market actually happened in 2012 when EX became the primary auction platform for all of the EU member states. At that time, not all of them, because UK was separate, but uh, all of the others uh, and all that's left today in the EU, they use EX as their auction platform to, to bring uh, the emission certificates into the market in a first step and collect uh, the money that they can use then for any green projects. So we've been in that role for uh, 10 years now, and and that, I think, also secured a, a big place for us and, and a big growth in the uh, emissions world. But even that one is still developing quickly. I mean, just last year, Germany introduced a new additional scheme for the sectors that are not covered by the European scheme, and that is, in particular, anything that has to do with heating or cooling and with transportation. So the, the scope of the European scheme covers about 40% of all the emissions in Europe. The heating, cooling and transportation is another 40% that now also has a carbon price uh, initially just in Germany, but there is an initiative on the European level to also create a second scheme for these sectors and create a price for that uh, market as well. And then you have the whole segment of the voluntary carbon markets, which we just entered into by listing uh, a couple of products on nodal exchange in the US, uh, where uh, it's not covered by mandatory schemes from the government, but driven by uh, the requirements and announcements of private companies to become carbon neutral and uh, offset the emissions that they still have. So I think there's we're still at the very beginning of a sustainability market just on carbon uh, because these mandatory schemes are I think there are about 21 or 22 in production these days in different parts of the world. And we are involved in many of them to design them in a way that ultimately they can be linked because the ultimate goal of all of this needs to be that we come to a global price of carbon. So in, in that regard, we, for example, created uh, a new market in New Zealand for the New Zealand government together with our local partner and ZX there, so that uh, you know there, the amount of carbon that is covered by all of these schemes is growing significantly over the next couple of years. That is absolutely fascinating. And, and I would love to go back actually in more detail about the emissions business at some stages. You know, we've been doing a series recently and actually we had uh, most recently, a couple of the guys on from Air Carbon Exchange at one point in time, who I know you've taken a great interest in just recently. Very, very good for you, too. Um, it would be great, actually, if we can manage to get your one of your product specialists on the show sometime, because I'd love to get him in front of myself and Steve Zwick and really go through the nitty gritty of unpacking all of that, that emissions carbon related market, because it's fascinating what you're doing, Peter. Really, really fascinating. And that brings me to a couple of questions. I'm going to take Robert Finney first, and then we're going to go to Martin Watkins. Thank you both for your questions. Oh, let me just say, first of all, good evening, John T. I, I don't worry about being late. You can always catch the rest of the show on catch up as soon as this 
live stream is over. Good to see you, John. Anyway, Robert Finney with a great question there. Where next for EEX geographically? Are there opportunities in emerging markets, developing countries? Some of them are developing carbon markets, but do producer markets in Africa, for example, offer possibilities for EEX growth? There are exchanges there and there has been some foreign interest. Peter, broad ranging question. It is, and it's uh, it's one that's probably not asset class specific because uh, obviously the development of the carbon markets will depend on uh, schemes, ETS, mandatory schemes being introduced by governments around the world, which is happening, uh, but it's really not clear where the next one will, will actually be placed. We're, we're involved in designing them uh, in all parts of the world, really, um, but it, the speed will be driven by, by government decisions uh, locally. On the other hand, you have the voluntary car market, which is global by nature. Uh, it doesn't matter where uh, the projects are located. Uh, some of them are in Africa, in South America, um, and uh, it's a market that really covers uh, uh, the whole globe. The main business of EX Group is still the power market, and we have been expanding uh, also the, the power markets in, in our uh, regional coverage. Obviously, our home base is uh, Europe, and we're offering uh, 20 different markets in Europe alone. And uh, obviously, through Nodal, uh, also cover the US market. But there's also still some potential where there's no trading market for power at all. Um, one great example of that is our market entry into the Japanese power market uh, two years ago. And it's all about uh, deregulation that has to come first before the exchange market even makes sense. And that's what happened in Japan uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, so they have moved from regional monopolies to a environment of competition. And that is where you need trading opportunities. And that's then a great opportunity for us to bring our knowledge and also our international community together uh, with the local community so that a market can be created. And that's been a wonderful uh, success story in our regional expansion. And, and Japan is just another example of that, the most recent one. Now, where is the next exchange markets going open in power also will depend on where the next uh, deregulation and, and uh, competitive environment for producers and consumers will be created because that's a prerequisite for an exchange market to work. Very good point and always vital to remember the prerequisites upon which our exchanges can thrive as they go forward. Thank you very, very much for that excellent question, Robert. I'm going to delay going to Martin Watkins for just a second. Patience, if you wouldn't mind. Delighted to see Ruben Indigikian is back with us today. Ruben, it's lovely to see you once again. Peter, where is the progress of introducing clearinghouse services of regulated commodity exchanges to OTC markets and in particular swaps? Well, on OTC markets, it's been a uh, constant movement, really, uh, that uh, OTC markets have moved into uh, cleared markets. When I started with EX, um, the exchange and cleared market was about 10% of the overall market. In uh, 2021, actually last year, it was the first time where more than 50% of the German power market was cleared. So that tells you there's still a, a lot of room to, to uh, grow also for us. Uh, so um, to bring the benefits of clearing to uh, those uh, parts of the market that are still using OTC markets uncleared. 
So it's been a, a trend that has been happening to various degrees in different parts of the world. So I just spoke about the German power market, which is by far the biggest in Europe. Um, but if you look at, for example, the Italian power market, uh, almost 100% of that is cleared. And it's a matter of market structure and uh, the, the composition of those who use this market. Whenever you have a small number of big players, uh, there is still room for OTC trades and big scale. When you have a broad set of market players that are pretty small, like we have in the Italian power market, then the benefits of clearing is much greater even, and that's why these markets move much faster. So that's all about the power market. So overall in Europe, I think uh, nowadays it's about 60% of the market is cleared. Um, and that's changing fast. And the current crisis is accelerating that trend. Um, and uh, it's also now broadening to the gas market. That's fascinating. That's really, really interesting to hear, actually. And thank you very much, Ruben Indijikian, for prompting that answer from Peter, because I must admit, I was not aware of just how far and fast the trend had been going. I realized it was improving. And it's very exciting to hear that so much of the market's going cleared. That's incredible. 100% pretty much of the Italian power market being cleared is a, is a stunning statistic to take away from today. Thank you very much, Peter. So let me just go back a step to Martin. And Watkins, thank you for waiting patiently for your question to be answered, Martin. Always a joy to have you on the show. What is the EEX position regarding blockchain technology? Blockchain technology is a wonderful tool. Uh, I think the uh, initial hype of blockchain technology that we had a couple of years ago has cooled off a little bit. I still think there is a, a great opportunity mainly in the uh, post-trade environment and in a also area that we have expanded into, which is the registry business. So I think there are many use cases also in the energy industry where blockchain can uh, make a difference and make markets more efficient. I don't see the major um, wholesale markets all move to blockchain trading, but there are services around that where I think blockchain can be a much more efficient tool than what, what is in place today. I think that's a very interesting point altogether, and I'm sure it'll be welcomed by the CEO of Montes Digital, a new CSD and settlement utility using the blockchain to hear you talking about the ways that it can work with well, registries and settlement, Peter. I think we're in heated agreement there. It's certainly very good. One other thing I, I always thought was very interesting about this has been the way that some quite dynamic companies have been using blockchain-based services to slightly reinvent the electricity markets from within. I mean, it's, it's very, very marginal at the moment. But if you look at, well, Perth and Western Australia that I mentioned before, the land that traded electricity markets forgot because it was so remote. I mean, let's say so that's the Australian city where the next nearest city is Singapore, depending on whichever direction you fly off rather than its own capital city in Canberra. Quite fascinating there to see how people are using blockchain technology like Power Ledger to enable people to take the solar power that they can generate on their roofs and then re hypothecate that back into the grid or trade it with their neighbors. It's obviously not going to make a huge difference right now, but it's certainly something that could be a fascinating potential for power markets in the future. I fully agree, Patrick. And it's been a field that we've been exploring as well. And it in the areas of the microgrids, as they're called, uh, it, it does make a, a, a lot of sense to use this tool because it's so much more efficient uh, with, let's say, your, your neighbors in the street. Uh, and uh, there, I think there is some cases also in the, in the power market where the trading can be done uh, much more efficient on a blockchain uh, technology. As I said, I don't see that happening anytime soon in the wholesale market, but I may be wrong on that. 
we shall see. Like all these changes, sometimes nothing seems to be happening and then all of a sudden it can happen very quickly. But I suppose that brings us very neatly. And actually, let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, we are at most 15 minutes from the end of this show. So if you've got a question or a comment for Peter Wrights, then let me know now. We're discussing building sustainable commodity markets and looking at the EEX experience of building those commodity exchanges sustainably. And a fascinating discussion we've been having one of your acquisitions, I think, is quite quite intriguing. Was that you bought actually a very interesting data hub company in 2020? So possibly didn't get as much of a, a notice from the general public because it was happening during the time when we were all obsessed with COVID. But you're talking about blockchain. You're talking about the integration of what must be a huge amount of data nowadays. It's not a blockchain company per se, but certainly KB Tech. Walk us through that, the rationale of how that fits into the EEX stack. KB Tech has been a partner of EX Group for a number of years, and they've been uh, instrumental in also bringing what is now EEX Asia, uh, which is what we developed out of our Clearstream, uh, uh, sorry, Clear Trade uh, acquisition. Uh, and KB Tech was instrumental in, in uh, also providing not only the, the whole infrastructure for data, but also the, the front end for trade entry and so on. So we've been working with them uh, over the years, and they have a fantastic skill set in terms of uh, technology to employ. The, all of the, what they do is cloud based these days, and it's uh, really a skill set that we needed to also develop additional service throughout the group. And, and we will actually be introducing a, a new uh, trade entry tool that is uh, developed by KB Tech uh, in uh, September this year. So it's wonderful uh, knowledge pool and, and uh, IT team that we have uh, gained through that acquisition that has benefited us in, in many market areas that we've where it went into. Fascinating. Really, really interesting to hear because, yes, it gives you a lot of, of power in the tech business. And comment from Ruben Indijiki. And thank you, Peter, for outlining progress in Europe. And thanks, Peter, for your comments concerning my question. And thank you, Ruben, for another very, very interesting intervention. It's always a delight to see you on IPO Vid. And thank you also for Martin Watkins for your question on blockchain. Let me rush then to a couple of deals you've done in the course of the last year, because I'm very interested in these. At the same time, I don't wish to I don't wish to deprecate other deals you did, like Gaspoint Nordic and integrating PowerPoint, Par, sorry, PowerPoint Parnext into EEX. I mean, those are huge deals which have really solidified your, your electricity market and your general energy position. But you acquired in 2021 um, La Cima Group. What, what was the, the, the whole rationale between that being added into the EEX's group? Uh, La Cima, for those who are not familiar with it, is, uh, is based in Sydney, and they're specialists in commodity risk management. And uh, we see that a lot of our clients uh, need solutions uh, that uh, give them more information on how a particular trade, if they do it, would change their overall risk position. So we've seen that need in the market. And uh, to some extent, we also expect that if people have these kind of tools available, that uh, will allow them to optimize their trading strategies and, and use their capital more efficiently and ultimately trade more with us. So we thought that offering that to all of our client base out of EEX Group would uh, accelerate the growth that La Cima has been enjoying because they had developed a, a wonderful tool set already that we can now bring to a much broader audience and uh, there are cross benefits also for our trading markets. Great. So further solidity to your data product business, because you're obviously generating a huge amount of data every day, adds to the KB tech angle in the data business and fundamentally enhances your overall degree of product risk management stack for the customer, client risk, everything like that. Very, very good. That's very clear. This year, 
done an interesting deal, uh, a partnership with, well, one of those companies that nobody on the planet has ever heard of until they read about the dairy business. And then you basically cannot avoid the fact that if you know anything about the dairy business, you've heard of Fonterra. You mentioned New Zealand Exchange NZX before, because indeed you've been helping them with creating a carbon market in NZX. And you've had a very good relationship with their chairman, James Miller, and the team over the course of the last few years building. So you built into this fascinating partnership with Fonterra. NZX and yourselves at EEX in the global dairy auction platform, Global Dairy Trade. That's quite a jump from all the way from energy, gas to milk, isn't it? It is a big jump, but we actually took that jump uh, many years ago uh, in, I think it was 2015 or so. Um, we moved the agricultural business from Eurex over to EX to bundle all of the commodity business of Deutsche Börse Group into EX. So we've been in the agricultural business for a number of years. Uh, one of our main products there is potatoes, a small market, but still a, a very uh, viable business for us. And the dairy is one element of that agricultural suite that we have that has uh, shown wonderful growth rates over the last uh, couple of years. And this deal with uh, GDT really brings our agricultural business into a new dimension. There's tremendous growth opportunities for GDT because they've been focused on their time zone so far. And we see uh, a lot of uh, opportunity and also uh, a lot of client need in Europe to create uh, these underlying uh, prices, which will then in turn also help to uh, grow our derivatives business based on it. So I think this is a fantastic growth opportunity. Uh, NZX has been a great and reliable partner for us in, in the previous business that we did with them in the environmental space. So it's sort of a, a natural uh, evaluation and uh, development of, of this whole field of dairy products. And actually, thank you very much for jogging my memory, because, yes, I was trying to remember the, the history. And if I remember correctly, I think, therefore, it was actually Deutsche Börse that bought the Hanover Commodity Exchange, the Warum Terminier Börse, if I got that correct. And then actually they took the products and the products went to EEX subsequently, if my memory serves me correctly. And that's how you got your sort of agricultural base. Is that right? That is absolutely right. That is something that I did uh, when I was working for Eurex. I brought this business into Deutsche Börse Group and uh, to Eurex at the time. And then, uh, as I said, in 2015, we moved it over to EX because it's a commodity business and that's where it fits best. Yeah. Yep, totally logical altogether. So look, I'm going to allow one last question from the audience before we get to our wrap-up question. But this has been such a fascinating conversation about building sustainable commodity exchanges and the EEX experience therein. Peter Seconds coming back to blockchain. How has blockchain commodity trading impacted commodity exchanges? And what does the future look like over the next 10 years with further adoption of crypto and blockchain alongside commodities? Uh, the, the, the first part I can answer, the, the second part I can only guess. Uh, so far, we have seen uh, very little impact on uh, commodity trading. There are some exchanges uh, that are using it in some markets, some niche markets, or there are some newcomers into the space uh, that are using it, for example, in the carbon markets. But the major wholesale uh, derivatives market have not been impacted uh, very much so far. Now, whether that will change over the next 10 years, I have no idea. Um, if you had asked me 10 years ago how these markets will develop and whether we see something that uh, we're seeing today, I would probably have been utterly wrong. So I won't uh, predict it. I think uh, blockchain does have a future and it will have a growing role. How far that will go and how quickly that will develop remains to be seen. 
Thank you very much, Peter, for that answer. And that brings us really, I think, to a perfect moment to ask the question we ask all our guests these days. Where do you think the capital market revolution is going to go next? Well, Patrick, I can't speak for the whole capital market, but the, the little piece that I'm looking at in the energy market, um, I think the energy market will develop uh, to a great extent in a tool to decarbonize our economy. And by that, I don't only mean uh, the carbon market that we talked a lot about. Uh, integrating renewable energy into the power market is a major uh, task that we do every day. And I think that our energy markets will be completely decarbonized. Hydrogen, we haven't talked about that market, a very fascinating opportunity will play a major role in that. We will see a global price of carbon, uh, merging mandatory and voluntary carbon markets. And uh, all of this will hopefully uh, help to save the planet. That at least is our mission. Ladies and gentlemen, we've spent an absolutely gripping hour with Peter Wrights. We've been discussing the whole fascinating issue of building sustainable commodity markets worldwide, looking at the EEX experience. Quite incredible to think that when Peter first joined the EEX, it was barely a 100-person operation in one office. They're now in 19 different nations across the world. They own the biggest power exchange in the United States of America, as well as the biggest power exchange in Europe. And they have expanded into a multiplicity of different products around the world, including, I have to say, as someone who comes from Ireland, possibly the most important commodity of them all, potatoes. But it's such an interesting thing to see such a broad-based group business. Peter writes, thank you very, very much for making this a fantastic show. Thank you very much to those who also were our adders of liquidity through questions and comments during the course of today. Les Calvert, Peter Second, thank you for the questions. Martin Watkins, great question as always, Martin. Marcus Ward, David Delahanty, John T. Robert Finney, thank you for your question. And Ruben in the JKN, excellent questions as always. My name is Patrick L. Young. Next week, we're going to have, oh, actually, in the meantime, don't forget, we've got a new podcast out right now talking to the fabulous Trabu Bland that was recorded on a sofa at the Boca Raton FIA conference in March. And we also had a guest appearance from Jamal Ul Haj of Ice Futures Abu Dhabi in that show. Really worth listening to again, about the dynamics of developing successful futures markets, something about which I think we've had a masterclass this evening from our special guest, Peter Wrights. Next Tuesday, Stephen Sears is going to be here developing your options. He is one of the most interesting people involved in the march to make options, something that can be part of every reasonably educated trader's life. Don't miss that next Tuesday, same time, same place. In the meantime, it only remains for me to say, well, thank you very much also, Robert Finney, for your final comment. Thank you to Peter Wright. You've been an absolutely marvellous guest discussing building sustainable commodity markets worldwide. Thank you to your terrific production team this evening, Racy, Jamil, Beata and Mary. Great job. This has been IPO Vid episode 74. See you next week and enjoy a great week in life, blockchain, and markets. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for having me.